Well, good morning. Welcome again to Word for the Week, our online book study series here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church. My name is Pastor Jeremy, and I'm so glad to be with you today as we take a look at uh, chapter 17 of Max Lucado's book, Traveling uh, Light. In chapter 17, uh, Lucado um, addresses the burden of doubt, and he calls that God's loving pursuit. Um, I think you've probably heard folks say before um, that there is no distance too far there's no distance so far away that you can run from God that he is unwilling to come and, and find you there. Uh, there is no, um, no space that you can create between you and God where he isn't willing to uh, travel to wherever you are, meet you there, pick you up, and bring you home. Now that's all really good news for us, right? That's good news because the reality is, as humans, we're we're probably going to find ourselves in in at least a place similar to that at some point in our life, right? We're going to get to a place where something bad has happened to us, uh, something difficult for us to understand, you know, a whole host of things, and we're going to find ourselves in a place where we feel distanced from God. Um, I'm going to say. 95% of the time that's our own doing, right? We, we've we brought ourselves to a place where that distance now exists between us and God. God didn't necessarily put us in that place. We have sort of followed after um, the ways of this world, our own thoughts and desires, and we find ourselves in that place. Now, <clears throat> how does that relate to the topic for today? Well, uh, Lakato is going to be talking about doubt in this chapter. Um, he shares an incredible story about a name, about, about a man named Eric Hill, who um, walked away from his family, um, and he became homeless and uh, lived for 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 decades along the side of a road in a vacant lot uh, as a homeless person. Um, and and the the gist of the story, if you haven't read it. I encourage you to do that, but the gist of the story is that his sister finally finds him and, and tries to sort of rekindle uh, a relationship with him. I'll let you read the details of that. Um, that leads to the idea of doubt in this way. Imagine, um, Max Lucado says, if, um, if, if someone in your life had, had walked completely away from you and as a sibling, as a spouse, as a, uh, a parent, as a child, you never gave up hope that you would have an opportunity to restore a relationship with them. And so really you commit to the idea that no matter how far you have to go, you will, you will go to meet them and rekindle that relationship with them. So this sister, of course, doesn't live in Texas where the young man ends up. She finds out that he's there. She makes her way there. She stays there with him, leaving her family behind for a bit of time in order to rekindle this relationship. That's the concept that Max Licato wants us to have and understand when we think about how doubt works out with our relationship with God. There is no distance so far from him that he won't come to us. And our doubt is what leads us to those places. Um, it's interesting. In uh, this study guide, if you if you didn't realize, the, the last portion of our book is a study guide, actually. And, and I haven't really drawn your attention there, but there's some incredible questions that have been part of this uh, series at the back of your book. One of the interesting things from the study guide for this chapter draws our attention to Romans chapter 14, starting at verse 19. And if you have your Bibles handy, um, maybe pause the video and, and turn there with me and read with me. This is Romans chapter 14, starting at verse 19. It says, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. Now, you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with doubt? Verse 23, but whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat, because their eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. 
the <clears throat> sort of difficult reality that I don't think Lucado took up so much in this chapter, but I sort of feel like we have to take up, is the reality that doubt is sin. When we doubt God, we sin against him. Now, you might say, but that seems incredibly unfair. You know, how can God count uh, our, our, our sort of doubt as sin? You know, aren't we allowed to have questions? Of course, we're allowed to have questions. Of course, we're allowed to ask him. We're allowed to ask others. We're allowed to ask our pastors. We're allowed to ask all kinds of questions. The problem of doubt, though, right, isn't so much about asking questions. Doubt is being unwilling to trust. And that's where the sin comes in. So let me give you an example. Um, you know, I've been in many situations uh, with youth in the church. Um, my first pastoral um, uh, job was a youth pastor, and I would often get questions from high school students, especially about, you know, well, how can we be sure of this? You know, what what would I tell my friends when they say, why do you believe this? You know, and, and there's there's all of these instances where especially young people come to a place of doubt and they go, I don't know, maybe this is just something that my parents and grandparents and my pastor have been telling me, but it's really not true. And and so should I actually believe it? And, and, and then they start to ask questions like, well, why? Pastor, why do we do this or do that? To me, that is a little different than doubt. Doubt is when someone has explained something to you or you've read in God's word and you go, yeah, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't think I believe that. I don't think I can get behind that. And, and the problem of this just on the base level is that when we doubt in that way, right? When we doubt, when we say, I don't think so, I don't get behind that, is that there's a lack of trust on our part. But if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse eight, it says, trust in the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. The, 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 the problem of doubt is that it causes us to lack trust. And at the end of the day, what God wants more than anything from us is our trust. Our trust that he loves us, that he is good to us, that he's going to provide for us, that that what, you know, how many times as a church have we talked about the, the covenant God established with his people that he maintains with you and I? I will be their God. They will be my people. Right. That that requires trust. We have to trust he will be God and he has to we have to trust that he will be God as long as we will be his people. There's a there's a trust element. there. So the problem of doubt is that it in it, it, it essentially renders trust useless to some point. Um, interestingly enough, in the chapter for today, uh, Max Licato brings up several instances. Um, at the bottom of page 145, it says, um, isn't this the kind of God described in the Bible? A God who follows us. There are many in the scriptures who would say so. You have to go no further than the third chapter of the first book before you find God in the role of a seeker. Adam and Eve are hiding in the bushes, partly to cover their bodies, partly to cover their sin. But God does wait for them to I'm sorry, but does God wait for them to come to him? No, the words ring out in the garden. Where are you? With that question, God began a quest for the heart of humanity that continues up to and through the moment you read these words. And so he talks about Moses. He says, Moses can tell you about it. He was 40 years in the desert when he looked over his shoulder and saw a bush blazing. And he talks about Jonah, uh, who, who finds himself in the middle of the ocean and then in a whale uh, or a, a big fish. Um, he talks about the disciples of Jesus and how they, they end up being sort of um, uh, following Jesus into this storm, right? Uh, and he sees them through. There's the Samaritan woman, John the apostle, Lazarus, Peter. And, and so it sort of resounds with this statement, God is a God who follows. I wonder if you have sensed him following you. We often miss him. Like Eric, that young man who became a homeless man, we don't know our helper. We don't know when he is near, but he comes to us. Doubt, doubt, right? That word, doubt, doubts. It doesn't trust that God will come to us and help us. Now, how does this tie into the shepherd psalm, the 23rd psalm each of these chapters has, right? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. 
uh, in order for you to say, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, uh, the first thing you have to do is trust. You have to trust that God actually will bring goodness and mercy. I mean, you can go out there and say it all you want to, but if you don't believe it, what's the point in saying it? You know, what's the point in going to your friends and saying, hey, you know what? God's going to give me goodness and mercy all the days of my life. If you don't believe that, why would you say it? So this last Sunday in worship, as we closed our worship service, we sang um, a song called Amazing Love. Uh, and uh, the, the chorus of that song says, Amazing Love. How can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It is my joy to follow you. In all I do, I follow you. And as we sang those lines, I actually asked the congregation in the midst of the song, do you believe that this morning? Because the, the thing of it is, what sense is there to sing amazing love, how can it be? Or uh, what, what sense is there to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know? Or what sense is there to sing, um, you know, even onward Christian soldiers going off to war with the cross of Jesus going on before? Uh, how great thou art. What, what sense is there in singing any of these things if you don't truly trust these things? If there's doubt there. So I guess I've sort of harped at you a bit now this morning, but, but I, I need for you to understand there's a problem with doubt. And the biggest problem with doubt is that there's a lack of trust. I never, ever want you to not ask questions. Always, always ask questions. I am where I am today in my faith, in my life as your pastor, because I asked questions. And it was a hard time for me. I grew up in a church where you typically didn't ask questions. When you asked questions, you were told you were being nosy or some other kind of crazy thing. You didn't ask questions. I asked questions. It's perfectly fine to ask questions. The problem is when we are asking questions out of a sense of wanting to be able to prove to ourselves that we know better than God, right? That's doubt, lacking a trust that he is right, he is good. And so if you're asking questions in order uh, for your heart to become better, uh, more knowledgeable of him, to become better um, uh, connected to him, ask away. But if you're asking questions to try to find an excuse to not believe, well, there's where sin comes in. That's called doubt and it lacks trust. I hope you guys will trust God this week. Truly trust him. I hope that you will ask questions of him this week. Um, I do need to say this also before I uh, end for this week. Um, next week is the last chapter of uh, Traveling Light, and it's been a great book. I hope you've really enjoyed it. Um, but you're probably wondering what will we do next. Um, and so I want to let you know that the book I've chosen uh, for, for next in this series is a, a, a very new book by a, a gentleman by the name of Jay Paletinier. Jay Paletinier. Okay. And the book is called, let me see if I can make it so you can actually see it. The book is called The Prayer of Agar. The Prayer of Agar. A-G-U-R. The Prayer of Agar. And the subtitle is Ancient Wisdom for Discovering Your Sweet Spot in Life. Uh, and this is a, a, a new book out by the publishing company Multinoma. Um, this author is, um, it says he is an affable and honest communicator who spent two decades producing national radio programs featuring Josh McDowell, Chuck Colson, Toby Mac, and others. And so it's, it's a, he's, he's certainly a well-known um, uh, writer. He also, by the way, is a partner for Iron Sharpens Iron in the National Center for Fathering. And, uh, and he also happens to be um, from Chicago. So uh, The Prayer of Agger is our next book. Um, it is available on Amazon. Um, if you would like to purchase your, your own copy, it is available on Amazon. Um, I did order a few copies that are available at the church office. So if you would like to come by the church office and pick up a copy, you are more than welcome to. They are $14 for your book. Um, and they're, they're going to be available in the church office, I believe, starting next, uh, next Wednesday. Um, so that would be March 3rd, I believe. Um, but it is the prayer beggar. 
Uh, and for those of you who are going to be ordering online or utilizing Amazon Kindle, uh, the ISBN number uh, of the of this book, I thought I had it for you here. Yeah, the ISBN number is nine seven eight dash zero dash five two five dash six five three eight three dash seven. Um, produced by Multnomah Books, Josh Paylet Senior, which is, uh, the the title is called The Prayer of Agar. So I look forward to getting into that with you as well. And I hope you guys have a great week. We'll look forward to seeing you soon.